Hello everyone, thank you very much for choosing to join me today and we're moving into discussions about blood pressure assessment which I'm guessing might be quite challenging in terms of social distancing um, rules at the moment so it'd be interesting in the discussion if uh, any of you have tips or information on that that you're happy to share I'd really love to hear how you're managing it. Um, but the goal for today really was to focus on one aspect of blood pressure monitoring, which is the whole issue of this uh, phenomenon called situational hypertension. And situational hypertension is actually a new term. So we used to talk about the white coat effect or stress associated increases in blood pressure. But this is our new, uh, I would say, the correct term that has uh, been suggested by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine for this uh, temporary increase in blood pressure that we can see in cats associated with stress. And the key things to know, to know about this are that firstly, it does happen. Um, it's thought to be pretty common. It does vary in severity. So as you can see on the slide, typically quite a, a small increase in blood pressure, sometimes a decrease in blood pressure. But in other cases, it can be really dramatic. So up to 75 millimetres of mercury documented, which is a, a massive increase in blood pressure. And of course, the key thing as a clinician is that because this is a temporary situation, it's not actually a pathological phenomenon. Our patients don't need treatment, but it's very relevant in terms of confusing our ability to diagnose systemic hypertension. And that's why we need to know about it. So the goals for this session for me were to focus on how we can address this issue. And the first thing, which I think we've covered just in that last slide, is, is awareness. Being aware of uh, situational hypertension is, is half the battle. So make sure that you know it's a possibility and consider it in your patients. The next step is going to be to look at ways that we can minimise uh, uh, situational hypertension. And that really comes down to cat-friendly tactics. And uh, this is a huge topic, so I'm just going to pick out very briefly, or try and be brief, um, some things which for, for us to consider uh, with this relevance. The first bugbear of mine is really advising clients on appropriate carriers for their cats because, as you will all know, um, there are some really unsuitable cat carriers out there and some of them can be quite popular with, with some owners and, and with their cats as well. The uh, picture on the very right hand side, a good example of a carrier that the cat can go into voluntarily, um, but if you want to get the cat out of the, the carrier and it doesn't want to come out, it can be incredibly difficult. So ideally we do want a top over opening carrier uh, or one that can be easily dismantled and we can examine our patients in, in the base of the carrier in that second situation. From a travel perspective um, and carrier perspective, again, other tips would include uh, not having your cat carriers live in the sort of dusty shed or garage, um, but rather, again, choose a carrier, which perhaps uh, uh, one with a detachable lid that could be one of the cat's uh, resting areas in the house so that it's uh, with the lid off, lives in the living room or the spare room or wherever else the cat frequents. And it's therefore not viewed as strange, alien, scary. It has familiar smells, perhaps toys and treats used to uh, to carry a train. There's a nice paper if anyone's interested I can I can share you on carrier training tactics. Um, also we can use Feliway spray before the cat is introduced to again leave that sensation or that leave that environment of um, reassurance for them before they move into it. For cats that uh, struggle with with being sick on car journeys, uh, withholding food can be can be helpful but possibly not otherwise required for a blood pressure assessment. Um, acclimatizing to car journeys can be helpful. Make sure the carrier is obviously well secured, ideally covered with a Feliway sprayed uh, towel or blanket. Um, and uh, trying not to choose a time to go to the clinic when travel might be difficult. Then the next step is, of course, the waiting area. And ideally, you really want the cat to not really have to spend any time in the waiting area. You want, hopefully, for them to go pretty much into the consulting room or whichever procedures room you're going to use to assess uh, their blood pressure. But if they do have to spend time in a waiting room, then it ideally should be cat only, as separated from the, the sight, the sound, the smell of other species as possible. And the cat would prefer it if it was the only cat in there as well. Not all of this is always uh, practically possible, of course. 
again offering uh, blankets or towels that are pre-sprayed with Feliway. Um, you can do this at the start of the day, put, put a pile of, of blankets or towels in your waiting room and that Feliway will have residual activity for certainly eight hours, so during your clinic day and then you can invite your clients to take one of those, put that over the carrier um, and then go into the consulting room with that and that same Feliway sprayed towel or blanket can form um, a base for the cat to sit on on the table if they come out of their carrier completely. Cats always like to be a bit raised as well so not having a carrier at floor level they prefer to be on a seat or higher which is why some of these cat uh, trees or sort of parking spots for cats I think are a very good idea if you can. Just a brief mention about silhouettes um, because um, we recently have learned that unfortunately um, cats can actually recognize silhouettes as being a cat. Um, and the, the reason that's unfortunate is because, you know, our well-intentioned artwork might therefore have uh, an unintended impact on our cat in terms of their stress levels. So for example, if they feel they're being stared at by something that looks like a cat or there's something that looks like a cat that's not very happy, then that's possibly going to have a, um, a harmful impact on the cat. So probably cat stencils best to avoid or to use ones of, of cats in very neutral sort of postures rather than anything that perhaps could have those unintended consequences. If you have a shared waiting room, perhaps there is a separate cat area, but it's overall it's the same room. Um, then there are some tips here in terms of uh, reducing anxiety for your cats. So things like using a, an adaptal diffuser to settle the dogs, as well as your Feliway diffuser to hopefully reassure the cats. Um, of course, separating as much as possible. If you can have cat only consulting times of day or on days of the week, that may uh, reduce the likelihood of them having to see a dog that's great also just be I think uh, resourceful in any way that works for your particular clinic whether that's using a spare consulting room should that exist uh, as a temporary cat waiting room um, or alternatively even just uh, inviting owners to stay in their car with their cat until the, the vet or nurse is ready to see them so that they don't have to spend time in that stressful waiting area and for cats that we know get stressed about the vet visit then perhaps timing the appointment uh, at a time where you think is least likely to be stressful might work as well so for example lunchtime first afternoon uh, surgery appointment for example might be a quieter calmer one for that cat Within the, the consulting room or the procedures room where blood pressure assessment is done um, again just continue that cat friendly approach so uh, ideally the cat should have time to acclimatize in that room before you do the procedure so ideally five to ten minutes um, before you actually start measurements where the cat can just sort of uh, get used to the environment uh, have maybe an explore if they want to or just a little bit of reassurance that you know before we perhaps pounce on them to do any procedures they've, they've got some breathing space um, and always try and do the the sort of no hurry approach that um, as probably all of you will know that tends to be faster in the end that, than, the, than trying to rush through a procedure with a cat. Gabapentin can be very helpful for cats that are particularly anxious. Um, gabapentin is not veterinary authorised, but it's a, a painkiller used for neuropathic pain in people. And uh, we've noticed in using it for pain in small animals and in, in cats, that often it does sedate them a little bit. So in recent years, that started to be used much more as a pre-visit sedation option. And uh, typical protocols involve giving about 20 milligrams per kilogram uh, to to the cat at home in a treat or a small amount of food about two hours before the, the cat basket is, is brought out and the cat is put into it. And uh, cats that have had this dose of gabapentin, so empirically it's often 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams per cat, um, will be just a little bit drowsy. They're fully conscious. Um, I would say to uh, my owners when I talk to them about this, it's, it's often like they're just a little bit zombified. So uh, they don't don't tend to move very much they turn into a little bit of a slug in the consulting room but they are conscious they're still aware therefore we still need to be cat friendly but it may be that it's 
it's easier to to do the assessments we want to do and the cat is is more calm because of this sedation effect um, and importantly uh, we don't believe that gabapentin has any impact on the blood pressure measurements that we get so it's not going to affect our interpretation and indeed hopefully will help it because we have a calmer cat so less likely to have this situational hypertension we hope for cats that don't like being handled the hands-off technique that i've referred to at the bottom is possibly one uh, rationale for using uh, a high definition oscillometric machine rather than a Doppler, which a Doppler tends to be my preference. But if you have a cat that really you cannot handle to do procedures, but you might be able to get a cuff around the tail and then the cat's sitting in the basket and you can get measurements from it, uh, that can be helpful. But I would certainly in cats that are that difficult to handle, I would go down the gabapentin route first. So that's two way, two parts through our solution. The final part of the solution is knowing what to do when you get a high reading. And in cats, systemic hypertension uh, definition is for a persistent pathological increase in blood pressure, 160 millimeters of, of mercury and above for their systolic blood pressure reading. So if we find our patient has a systolic blood pressure of 160 or above, the two possibilities are they could be genuinely hypertensive or they could have this, this uh, transient increase in blood pressure associated with stress, the so-called situational hypertension. So the steps to follow are firstly, make sure that you are as cat friendly as possible in collecting those measurements. So make sure you include that acclimatization period, for example. Next thing is to look for evidence of target organ damage and in particular an eye examination. This is a subject of a, a later cat, uh, uh, sorry, a top tips uh, session coming up in, in the next few weeks. So we'll, we'll look at how we examine the eyes and, and what uh, findings we look for as clues there. If we do see evidence of target organ damage on our eye examination, then we have uh, confirmed the diagnosis in a cat with a high reading and ocular abnormalities consistent with high blood pressure. So that's why that is very helpful. In those cases that don't have obvious evidence of ocular damage, then we need to show persistence of the high reading. And the current guidelines are that if we get a reading of 180 or higher, that is consistent with severe hypertension and there is a high risk of target organ damage. Therefore, um, if we have a reading above that level, we should monitor again within a couple of weeks. And if the, the results are persistently of that same magnitude, um, then even if there isn't target organ damage, if we've done everything else in this list, um, we have got justification to treat that cat uh, for hypertension especially if we know it's got an underlying disease associated with high, bl high blood pressure, such as uh, chronic kidney disease. With blood pressures between 160 and 180, we've got a little bit more time to, if you like, make up our mind as to whether or not we think this is a genuine hypertension versus uh, situational hypertension, because there's a lower risk of blood pressures of that magnitude causing target organ damage. So that's why it allows one to two months for us to complete our assessment, if you like. Other things we can do, of course, are if we're doing this, if we're finding these high readings in an older cat, perhaps we're doing a health screening uh, assessment um, and the cat is reported to be healthy, then we might, if we are getting persistently high readings, feel that it's justified to look for evidence of underlying diseases with an association with hypertension, such as chronic kidney disease. Um, and indeed, we can also look for other evidence of target organ damage. And uh, one other example would be proteinuria, um, increase uh, protein loss in the urine. So in summary, uh, stress and anxiety definitely can have a, a massive impact on our blood pressure and can really complicate our ability to diagnose systemic hypertension. So it is important to be aware of this phenomenon and to, I think, have in your mind a plan as to how you're going to hopefully minimise its occurrence, but also deal with it when you do see it. And I hope that um, what I've uh, talked about in this uh, last few minutes has been helpful in terms of, of your future strategies in this area. There are, as usual, more resources on the website related to blood pressure. There are some videos, there are some technical guides, um, uh, all sorts of resources as highlighted on this slide. And if you'd like a copy of the slides I've used, um, just drop us an email at the address on this slide as well. And finally, uh, next time the session will be continuing the blood pressure theme, talking about how we can, uh, my top tips, if you like, for getting reliable blood pressure measurements for pa from patients. 
So thank you very much again for tuning in and I'll now be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. <laughs>